Hi, I'm a POGO community expert, Jo Lane, and today I'll be sharing some top tips with you on ensuring student success in exams. Achieving exam success can be seen as a huge mountain to climb for pupils in year 11 and year 13. So what we really need to do as professionals is break it down into manageable chunks. And one of the formulas that we've seen that works is by breaking it down into five distinct areas. And these are decisions, destinations, resources, knowledges, and D-Day, which is the actual exam day. So if we take a look at the first element, decisions, what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is that your students need to take a decision that they can do this because such a lot of success is down to an individual's mindset. And this is really important from when you start your revision. It's never too late to change your mindset, but the sooner you can get in there, into their mind and say, I can do this, the better. So help your students decide that they can do it. And how can we do this? I really like this quote that says, hard work makes the impossible possible. Now, without having too many motivational quotes around the classroom, I think if you can instill this into your student's brain, then suddenly something seems achievable by hard work. And this is what we really like to see. So how do we make the impossible seem achievable? Well, one of the key elements that we can do is to ensure that they have very clear destination to pursue. And very often in, with pupils that I teach and who I offer careers advice to, they're sitting exams and they have no idea why. You have to have a bigger picture. And I find a really good way of doing this is visually. So I'm just going to show you a little tip that I've got here today when it comes to destinations. And I did this recently with one of my pupils and I wrote it down on a bit of paper and I scribbled in, um, in my not so GCSE art state that I do. And um, afterwards I said, would you like me to type this all up for you? And he just said, no miss, can I just have that bit of paper? So I think there's something to be said for that. So this is what, we, this is what I did and this is what I think is worth sharing. So we look at the individual. Where are they? So this is today and where do they want to go? Now, hopefully, your students will have a plan A and a plan B. That's actually quite important because in order to get here or here, you've got a journey to go along. But this, this is September, for example, okay? This is when, after you've finished your GCSEs or after you've finished your A-levels, this is the time scale that you're working towards. And today, you're here. How are we gonna get there? What are you gonna do? So, the next key point we need to look at is Easter, okay? This will be mock exams. Generally, um, across the board. So suddenly, Rather than just looking at today and looking at June, we've broken it down into a smaller chunk and we're looking at where do I need to get to first. I get to Easter to do my mock exams. After my mock exams, I've actually got the real thing, May or June time. And this is really helpful for young people because so many weeks, it might be 12 weeks, can just seem far too long. So by saying, right, you've got five weeks till Easter, and then you've got another seven weeks. Um, it allows them to have more planning and more focus and, um, and just like make it seem like this mountain that they're trying to climb is in stages. So if you do this, there's more chance that within here and within here, we'll look at these, these um, stages here, that you will be able to see the bigger picture and help the, the, your pupils see the bigger picture. You then get to your exams. 
and we've got ways of helping pupils think about how they're going to deal with the exams. And then not to forget, in here, you've got a really nice long summer. And having that vision is really like the end game because that is a lovely, lovely long summer. So help them see that there is a bit of light at the end of the tunnel before they get to September, where they're going to go next. Here you've got August day, you've got the results day. What we have to be careful of here is that depending on the results, if you're not able to go down this path, path A, it's not the end of the world if they have to go to path B. And that's really, really important because very often on results day, young people will come in with their parents, look at an envelope, it doesn't say what they need it to say and the world is going to end. If you can um, preempt the fact that sometimes things might go wrong, and that's not being negative, it's just being realistic, and that therefore there are different alternatives, different paths to take, which will eventually lead in the same direction, which is success. Um, this is just a really nice way to look at it and it's worked with my pupils in the past and I would encourage you to try and demonstrate this to people who are struggling to get on board. Another way that I um, love to motivate pupils is to talk about vision boards and um, some of you may have come across those in the past, you might have your own at home, um, but again, um, for those who are visual and most of us are to a certain extent, I think this can really work. So. I shall just rub this out quickly and let's have a vision board. So this can take different forms and um, you could have your own individual vision board. And if we look at people's um, motivations and what they like. What you want to ask them is, if you are, I always say to my pupils, when you're older, what car do you want to drive? Where do you want to live? What kind of holidays do you want to go on? And they look at me as if I'm a bit crazy sometimes, but basically it's about saying to them, you're going to want certain things in life and in order to achieve them, you have to take a certain path. So why not suggest that they have a picture of their BMW. I'm sure this is because I teach in a boys' school, so normally it's quite a male car. Um, their holidays, often we talk about their first boys' holiday. Where are they going to go? And then where they're going to live. A lot of it is to do with what they wear and the labels that they wear these days. And then they've got them down here. So sometimes we talk about how much they want to earn. Now this is quite scary sometimes because they think they're going to leave school and earn £50,000. But we kind of look at saying, well actually by the time I'm 25, I'd like to be earning £30,000 for example. Okay, so how am I going to get there? Well this is me at the moment. I'm in year 11 or 13. What um, what steps do I need to take in order to get to this position where I'm earning £30,000? So, what grades do I need to get? That's an R. What grades do I need to get in order to progress onto that college course, the university degree? Which university do you want to go to? Do we need a picture of the university there? What about an apprenticeship? What do I need to get to the apprenticeship? It could be um, you want to work in finance in the city. What about a nice picture of the gherkin there? Okay. And by having something like this and asking them to take some ownership of it um, allows them to see the bigger picture. And I've also thought of a really nice idea would be to have a class vision board.
And this is something that is actually almost like you could leave as a legacy. Um, many schools are really interested now in saying um, these were our pupils and this is where they are now. And in fact, um, particularly with alumni growing and having a real value to school, um, a class vision board is a great kind of like starting point. So what you could do is you can break it down into the individuals. I suppose it's a take on the old sort of like yearbook really. Um, but in here, you've got Max, his aim to be a lawyer. And then you go through and you've just got this. And it's just letting people know that they're sharing their vision. And um, I think this could be a really nice idea um, if it's like an, in a tutor group or if it's in a specific um, class. Tutor group probably is a really nice idea because you have that kind of like, you've been in that group for three, five years um, and, um, and you kind of like, you will always remember what house you were in, for example, when you were at school. Uh, this is really good to then look back in two years time, five years time and um, as, an, as a professional, where are they now? How did I help them get there? So, if we recap slightly, we have got our students to decide, I can do this, I've got a goal, I know where I'm going to go. Well, the next thing we need to think about is knuckling down to that revision. So, if we rub this out, let's have a little think about resources. Now, last year my daughter did GCSEs and I probably could have taken out shares in Ryman's, the amount of money I spent there. However, um, in my head it was like, whatever works. But I do think, joking aside, that um, the resources that you equip young people with in order to help them with their revision and, and studying is really quite important. So, for example, the favoured post-it note. Encourage your pupils to put key points and information on these post-it notes. And um, you can do this in class, you get into the habit of doing that in class, you probably do it already, um, but on this you have your key fact, you might have an equation, but the important thing to, about this, you might have a date of an important year, you might have, and also this is really important as well for those visual learners, you may just have a few examples. So if it's a body part, you know, if it's biology, something to do with the heart, um, anything like that to encourage them to break away from writing endless, endless notes because the um, statistics show that having too many notes and not enough kind of like space around you can be really um, limiting on what you're going to um, retain with regards to information. Again, the highlighter, the wonderful highlighter. But again, you have to be really careful because you will see and I often see young people who have got a page of text and they get so bogged down with highlighting that it actually they just end up highlighting the whole page and therefore they're never going to remember that. It just looks even more jumbled than it did when it was a plain page of text. So highlighters have a purpose, um, but really it's almost like you need to guide them on how to use them um, when they're going through their notes, when they're going through their exercise books. One of the best ways, and one way that is stated as being the most useful for retaining facts is the wonderful mind map. And don't worry about having to make all of these yourself. Um, there are some amazing people um, on TES who produce resources like this and have um, a real flair and art for doing it. And I just think, why reinvent the wheel? If you put something into TES resources, and you come across something like this, use it. Your pupils will love it. And it's really good for those of all abilities because it, it really, really helps. It helps the lower ability pupils because if you give them this at the start of a revision session, 
then you just let them go with it see what they can fill in and very very quickly as a, as a teacher you will be able to establish how much content from something you, you might have done two years ago they have recalled so um, this is a lovely way and then what they can do I create little folders for them of the different mind maps on different topics and they can then take them away and then they add to them so then you allow them to do their own independent study on it but it really helps give some clarity because the scary thing that I discovered last year is that as a teacher you are just worried about your subject but when you see it from a parent perspective my daughter last year 11 GCSEs with two years of content of the curriculum folders everywhere, files everywhere, books everywhere. That is such a lot of content. And even as a teacher and a professional, I would, I would look at that and think, how on earth are you gonna remember all that? So is it any surprise that they, th they feel the same? And that little doubt, the little gremlin comes in and says, I can't do this. So the easier you, it is to break down the content, it's gonna be it's going to remove that kind of like overwhelming like how am I ever going to remember this so really please do encourage use of mind maps either download them or ask them to make their own that's a really lovely way of um, running a session in a class revision session after school get them to make their own mind maps share them on different topics um, one thing I would stress and I hate to hear this but it does happen every year if you're uh, a teacher of a subject Please don't make pupils feel that your subject is more important than any other. They have enough to balance without balancing your kind of like little bit of pressure, a little bit of guilt that they need to spend more time on your topic so or on your subject rather. So um, as much as you are very keen to get the best results for yourself, please do bear in mind that these young people are balancing an awful lot of revision and therefore um, don't add extra pressure onto them for that. Their environment is really important where they study. Most of the study and revision takes place in the bedroom, but again, ask your pupils to take control of that a little bit. If they're squeezed in a cluttered bedroom with loads of clothes, books, junk all over the floor, a cluttered room is just gonna feed a cluttered mind. So encourage them to get a decent working space around them. And that's really, really important. Use different spaces too. Often we find by encouraging pupils to use the library or like your resource centre at school, just for like half an hour after school, can be far more effective than them going home for an hour and a half in their bedroom, getting distracted, mobile phone. So, um, ask them to think about the different places that they are going to revise. Um, a revision buddy is a really good idea, and um, as are YouTube videos, there's, there's so many different ways that they can revise. So give them a, like a menu, as it were, um, rather than just a textbook and their exercise book from school, because that is not the way to achieve success. A little note on mobile phones, um, the bane of everyone's life, but one of the things that we'll need to do and that is to um, turn off notifications. We know that it goes on the whole time with young people and the number of notifications they get within an hour is scary and with all the will in the world they're never going to be able to resist looking at their phone if it keeps bibbing away with the little things flashing up. So 45 minutes, set their timer, on their phone, notifications off, and it will feel like they've got more control over it. Um, and it's a much, they just have to do it basically. You really should encourage them to do that. Okay, so we've looked at the resources. Um, we've also brought in the knowledge um, and how the two very closely work together. And um, it's really important that topics become like the, the core for revision. And, um, and a revision timetable is a must really in order to manage the workload. And um, what really works is, and some, some young people will need your guidance with this because they don't always get it at home. Um, and you have a real mixture of support 
mechanisms that young people will have. So give them the opportunity to work out a revision timetable based on their exam times because that makes it might sound quite obvious to us but um, again you know if their history exam is towards the end of the uh, sort of four or five week exam period then you need to kind of like balance that out against the science exams that might be at the beginning which they tend to be so a revision timetable in order to manage the knowledge that they've got to learn is, is key. So the mind maps have been done, the post-it notes have been stuck around the bedroom, the kitchen, the classroom for weeks, and then suddenly it is D-Day, it's exam day. So what advice can we give to our students when the exams actually start? So first advice really for D-Day, don't cram the night before. That's not a healthy way for a young person to be approaching an exam the following day. If they've been organised enough and they've got their mind maps, the perfect thing to do would be to just scour over, skim read a mind map the night before so you can think, right, I've covered that. Exercise is really important at this time in order to like manage stress levels because they will get stressed. And as we all know, exercise is great for that. So encourage exercise and encourage mobile phones going off and getting to sleep and getting a decent night's sleep beforehand. Food is really important on the, the morning of exams and um, we have a, an agreement with our local co-op and they provide us with bananas for our pupils. So um, we call them banana revision breakfasts. Different teachers run half hour sessions on the morning of their exams. Kids can have a banana um, and at the very least as a, as a teacher you can feel confident that even though some of those pupils that may have come in with nothing in their tummy, um, you've given them the opportunity to um, eat something nutritious and to, to fill that gap. So um, yeah, so speak to your local supermarket, they'll be very happy to oblige I'm sure. A mantra for all of your pupils, read the question. This should be everywhere around the room um, and, I, and naturally you will do loads and loads of um, practice papers but nerves can get the better of you on the day so you really just want to instill that kind of like it's like a process really I've got my pen I've got my water bottle I must make sure I read the question pen water bottle read the question it's kind of like yeah like having a mantra really and um, if you can instill that in your pupils. One of the um, elements that we should encourage pupils to avoid is what we call like the exam post-mortem. And we've all done it and you've all seen them come out of the exam and they all huddle around and they say, what did you write for that question? What did you write for that question? And then suddenly you can see someone's face go grey because they realise that actually, no, they didn't put that. And the thing is, the problem is then, there's nothing they can do about it. So the best thing to do is to encourage pupils to think, I've handed that paper in, that's the end of that paper, I can't do anything about it now, I've just got to wait till August to see what my results are. Because the chances are, when you do a post-mortem and you're speaking to lots of other different, um, your friends and your peers, who's to say that they're actually right and then you just it's, it's just really counterproductive um, and people should be discouraged from doing that and you can help them do that as they come out of the exam room. One thing I would say and avoid exam post mortem. It's not happy and it can leave you feeling really sad and like it could put you in a negative mindset for the following exams. So um, add that to your little checklist for your pupils. So hopefully, there are many things that will impact on a pupil's um, exam success. But if we're able to break it down and engage them in these five key areas, if we do that now, um, then the hope is that when it comes to August, and opening that envelope, 
then your pupils are going to be feeling satisfied that they've done their best, satisfied that they've thought and hopefully have made the impossible possible and they're able to progress onto the next stages in their life, whether that's post-16 study, post-18. Pathways are so important. They've identified their destinations um, and ultimately the success in their exams will lead them to these destinations. For more advice on student success in exams, check out the videos below. Thank you and see you next time.